All right, good morning, everybody. It is so wonderful to see everyone. It is so wonderful to be back here to begin our week together. It really is special that we have this opportunity to learn together and to spend time every Sunday morning, starting our week with a fresh start, with inspiration, hopefully. And uh, it really is a true privilege for me to be here with all y'all every Sunday morning. So without any further ado, let's jump right in because we have only two weeks till we will be standing before the Almighty, uh, pleading for our case of life, that it should be a year of good health, it should be a year of success, uh, with a great livelihood, etc., etc. So our sages teach us that on Rosh Hashanah, it is the, not only the first day of our uh, Jewish calendar, but it's also the first day of creation, right? It is the first day of the creation of man, where God created Zayom Tchilat Masecha. This is the first day where Hashem created mankind. And we know, we've said this before, previously, that there are seasons. There's a season, I, I don't know if, if any of you have favorite seasons, because in Houston, there basically is one season. There's summer, and then there's very hot. So uh, that's our, our constant state. But you go to other places, you go to Connecticut, and they have beautiful you know, foliage. It is just it's magnificent. And you go to the other places you know, where they have winter, and there's ice, snow-capped mountains, and it's just it's beautiful. And they have seasons, right? And every season brings back certain feelings, certain more. For example, I love spring. Spring is my favorite. I, I just, I, I'll take spring all year long, right? But unfortunately, we don't have that luxury here in Houston. Um, and it's either summer or it's hotter. And the seasons of spirituality are exactly the same in that there's a certain environment that comes with every holiday. And when we have on Rosh Hashanah, the time for judgment. It's a time of seriousness. My rabbi would always say, it's a time of accountability. It's a time of taking responsibility. It's a time where we say, you know what, Hashem, the buck stops with me. I made my decisions for my year. It's my responsibility to ensure that I be productive, that I fulfill the, the, the necessary uh, fulfillment, that the, the necessary uh, uh, obligations of my life. And this is what we are aiming for every day of our year. But sometimes we fall short. So we have another Rosh Hashanah where hopefully God will grant us another great year. We have a Yom Kippur to receive hopefully atonement for those mistakes. But that season every year that comes back for us to make amends, to correct the things that were, were wrong, and to get onto the right path. It's a very interesting Midrash. The Midrash says that when Moses ascended to the heavens to receive the Torah, he had to go through all seven firmaments. And the sages tell us that in each of the firmaments, Moshe was greeted by a group of angels. And he reached the first firmament and the, the angels were reading of the creation of the first day of creation. And then they started praising the Torah. The second firmament, higher ranking angels. And then they started reading the second day of the Torah, the second day of creation from the Torah. Mm -hmm. And praising Israel, the Jewish people. The third the third uh, uh, firmament is even higher ranking angels and they were reading the third day of creation and they were praising Jerusalem. And then the fourth, even higher ranking angels and they were praising Mashiach, the Messiah. And uh, obviously read the fourth day of creation. The fifth day, the fifth firmament, even higher ranking angels. And the, the Midrash goes through each one of these firmaments, higher ranking angels and gives all the names of those angels. And they were reading the fifth day, sixth day, and then uh, they were praising Gehenna, right? Gehenna is a very interesting thing. Why is Gehenna uh, is something that's praiseworthy? We always assume Gehenna is terrible, like purgatory. It's, it's awful, right? But think of it as like a, 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 uh, a power wash. Right? We get a soul that is pure and beautiful and sparkling, but sometimes we can get it dirty. 
We don't realize how privileged we are to have such a holy, lofty soul. And we can get it a little dirty. So Hashem says, I don't want to put a dirty stone and a gem back in my crown. Right? I'm going to have to just power wash it a little bit. That's purgatory. It's not a permanent state. It's not a, 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 a eternal damnation like other religions would like you to believe. But rather, it's a temporary state of cleansing so that our gem can sparkle and shine and be placed into, the, into, God's, uh, um, into God's crown. So Gehenna is praiseworthy as well, right? Um, it's, not, it's obviously not very pleasant, but it's still praiseworthy. So we have Gehenna, and then the, the sixth is the they, even higher ranking angels, and they read the sixth day of creation, creation of mankind, and then they started praising Olam Abba, right? The Garden of Eden, actually. Okay. Comes the seventh day of creation, which is the Shabbos, which is the lack of creation. And what did they praise? They finished saying, Right, they think they read the seventh day of creation, so to speak, right from the Torah. And then what happens? And then they stop and they don't praise Torah, they don't praise Israel, they don't praise Jerusalem, they don't praise the Messiah, they don't praise Gehenna, they don't praise the Garden of Eden. What is the highest level of praise received on the highest firmament where you have the highest ranking angels? It's the closest to God's throne. Surprisingly, the highest praise from the highest ranking angels and the highest firmament was teshuva, repentance. And you wonder, of all things, repentance? Repentance is the highest, most praiseworthy thing. It really is. It's shocking. Of all things. Our sages explain an unbelievable idea. What is repentance? So most of us think is repentance is I go over to all the people that I may have hurt their feelings. I may have insulted them and ask them for forgiveness. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do this. It was unintentional. I forgot. It was by mistake. All of the excuses that we give, even if they're sincere, uh, we go and ask for forgiveness, and then we have we repent for those sins. Is that really what forgiveness is? Is that really what repentance is? So let's take a look at what a sin is. What is a mitzvah? A mitzvah is something that brings us closer to the Almighty. Every mitzvah that we have of the 613 commandments in the Torah Every single mitzvah brings us closer to the Almighty. That's its goal. When a person, when a man puts on tzitzit, on a four-cornered garment, he is finding a way to bring godliness onto his body. When a person prays, they're bringing God onto their lips. They're bringing God into their consciousness. When a person does an, an act of kindness, they're bringing God into their hands that they're doing those acts of kindness. And our sages say that each one of the mitzvah reflects a different part of our body. You know, in this week's parsha, there's a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, we had this, this past week, we read how the Jewish people were warned for any sins. And if anyone does these sins, they will be cursed. And if anyone does these Good deeds, they will be blessed. One of the blessings is if a man does not create and serve an idol. If you don't create and serve an idol, guess what? You've got blessing coming your way. <laughs> well, that's an easy one. Because all I, gotta, all I have to do is stay away from idolatry, right? All I have to do is not build an idol. I don't have to, right? Not buy one of those statues, uh, you know, with... Uh, whatever it is that, that would be an, I, I, idolatry. And I'm good to go. Right? It's pretty easy. And yet it says, Baruch, he should be blessed. Such a person should be blessed. And this is one of the blessings, right? They had two mountains, the Har Grizim and Har Eval. And over here, they were mentioning all of the curses for someone who does terrible things. 
And here is all the praises and all the blessings that, that come to a person who does the right thing. And one of those right things is one who stays away from idolatry. Such a great blessing for someone who just doesn't do something. I mean, it's not that difficult. I don't know about you, but for me, I never really had a temptation for idolatry. Right? It's not really on my top 10 list. Right? Of all the things I want to do, right, is idolatry. So yet, it is a blessing for it. So I say to say, such an amazing and important idea. Do you know what idolatry is referring to? Money. Money. Of all things, idolatry, we think it's bowing down to some idol. No, 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 no. Do we idolatize? Do we, do we idolize money? Money, financial success, fame. There are people who idolize, you know, people, oh my goodness, this person has so much money. Oh my goodness, I want to talk to him. I want to, I want, I want to be like him. That's idolatry. Our so Torah tells us, I understand the difficulty of idolatry. If you stay away from idolatry, the blessing that will come to you will be incredible. And it's this week's parsha. So a mitzvah, okay, and this is a big mitzvah. A mitzvah gets us closer to the Almighty. A sin distances us from the Almighty. Okay? That is the reality of how the spiritual world works. Right? We follow God's commandments. Is the, the, the Torah is a manual for closeness to Hashem. And when we follow the mitzvahs, what happens? We get closer. And when we don't follow, we get distant from the Almighty. So how does a person, right, who distances himself from the Almighty, how does he regain the ground that was lost? Okay, if I did a sin, now I just distanced myself. I did another sin, dis distanced myself again. And now I'm, I'm so far away. How do I get closer? That's repentance. Repentance is the clarity that a person has. I remember it's an example I give. I don't know if it's a good one, but it's one that worked for me over the years to help understand what this is about. You know, when, when I was in high school, we had some pranksters in our class and they'd like to play some pranks on the teacher. And the teacher didn't know what to do. What is he going to do with this uh, rambunctious group of uh, uh, high schoolers? And so he told the principal to come in and check up on the class. Now, principal was a very, very slick individual and, you know, shrewd. And what he did was, is he slipped into the classroom while everyone was sitting down. Nobody realized he was standing in the back of the classroom. Just standing, leaning against the back wall. And when the kids did a prank on the teacher, he like hit the back wall and everyone stopped and turned around and everyone's faces turned white. You mean that he saw us this whole time? He was right there and we didn't realize he was standing right there. Or imagine if children are talking, right? And they don't realize that their parent is standing in the room or, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's like I've had so many times where people are having a conversation and they didn't realize that I was already in the room and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, Rabbi. It's like, you know, it's like, it's okay, all right? Obviously, we don't always, you know, or you, if you don't realize there's a camera today, everything is recorded, everything is on camera. You know, it's an amazing thing. Speaking of cameras, do you know that just about everything on planet Earth is being videoed 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? Today, we have cameras everywhere. Right, every doorbell is a camera. Right, you walk in a parking lot, there's a camera. Wherever you go, there's a camera. It's an important reminder that the Almighty sees everything. Forget about the people behind the camera. The Almighty sees everything. If a little camera, a little lens can see everything we do, certainly the Almighty can see everything we do. So our sages tell us, that when we distance ourselves from the Almighty, what we're doing is we're creating a barrier. 
teshuva means to return. It, we return to our state of closeness with the Almighty without those barriers in between us. So now let me ask you a question. What is the purpose of Torah? To bring us close to God. What is the purpose of Israel? To bring us close to God. What is the purpose of Jerusalem? To bring us close to God. What is the purpose of Messiah? To bring us close to God. What is the purpose of Gehenna? To bring us close to God. What is the purpose of the Garden of Eden? To bring us close to God. What is Teshuva? It's not to bring us close to God. It is the closeness of God. That's why it is the highest ranking praise that our sages tell us is Teshuva. When a person repents, they are in that closeness with Hashem. They say, wow, I didn't realize the Almighty sees everything that's going on. The Almighty knows everything. He was standing there the entire time. How could I not have realized and recognized that he is right there? I would never have done that if I, if I had known the principle of standing there. I would never have done that. I would never have done, said that if I, would have, if I knew that the Almighty is right there next to me. But it slipped my mind. That is Teshuvah. Teshuvah is when we come to a recognition that the Almighty is everywhere. He was, he is, and he will be. Right? There is nothing that we say or do that the Almighty doesn't see and record and listen to. By the way, that's in a negative and in a positive. Because the Almighty also hears every single word of our prayers. When we pray, do you know what the Almighty does? He listens. He listens to every word that we say. So regardless of whether or not we feel close or not, the Almighty is always there. And Teshuvah is the opportunity to declare that closeness. Teshuvah is that opportunity to remove the barriers that we have created, that we have constructed between us and the Almighty. That is the greatness of Teshuva. And that's why it's the highest ranking of all of the gifts that God gave our world, Teshuva, that you can clear it away. And I don't know if I mentioned this, right? I like to say that Teshuva means it's like a, a pencil, right? You write with a pencil and you erase it, it's gone. So as if it was never there. There's no marking. There's nothing left. Right? But there are other things that you can write with and try to erase, but it still leaves a mark. The Almighty is like a pencil. When God forgives us, it's forgotten. It's over. It doesn't, it's not like I forgive you if you don't do it again. Then I, you know, if you do it again, I'll pull the file again. I'll say, Oh, see, it's your second time. No. It's your first time because the first the the, the 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 previous time was forgiven. The power of teshuva is so incredible. A person needs to know. Each of us needs to know the incredible and awesome responsibility of teshuva. You know, there's a story told about a synagogue in the. Uh, on the West Coast, they didn't have a rabbi. For years, they didn't have a rabbi. One year on Yom Kippur, some, someone went to the ark to open up the, the ark for Kol Nidre. And as they opened up the ark, the Sefer Torah fell out. And we know the community had to fast for 40 days. It's really devastating for a community. So, they said to themselves, you know, this is a wake-up call. This is a wake-up call. We all have wake-up calls. And they said, you know why God possibly did this to us? We need a rabbi. They took a look. They reflected upon themselves. They said, something's got to change. You know, we're living in a world today where we, for many of us, have been irregularly inconvenienced by this COVID-19. And we have to figure out a way to not return to ordinary. We must figure out a way to not let this be just another day. 
well, we were inconvenienced, you know, COVID, this and that, and then we just return back to our regular way of life. God is trying to shake up this planet and tell us, wake up. And we've said this before, but it's collectively as a community, it's as a society and as individuals with our own families. What are we doing to change? Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur is a very powerful time. You know, one of the prayers that we read, and it's going to be frightening to read this again this year, in our, in our prayers on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is Nisana Tokef. Nisana Tokef is a very, very powerful prayer for the high holidays. And in it, we say basically everything that you need to know is that God, you created the world. We may have lost focus, but we're begging for another chance. God, only you know who will live and who will die, who will die by famine, who will die by plague, who will die, right? And all of, all of these things. We, and then we say three amazing words, Uteshuva, Tefila, Utsadaka, Mavir, Nisra, Gezira. Three things that remove and annul the bad decree. Teshuva, repentance. Tefila, prayer. And Sadaka, charity. These three have the unbelievable power to reverse any decree. And, you know, it's like, it's, it really is frightening because in 14 days from today will be the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And that's it. That's the day where we are standing in judgment before the Almighty. And while we're at it, I would like to share with you that I'm going to be sending out an email today giving everyone an opportunity to either join a pop-up shul, which is going to be my, at my outside my house. We have a going to have a shaded area, um, hopefully with mist fans, so that everyone can, can be cool. But it's going to be limited space. We're going to have services throughout the day, short abbreviated services, but, but you can actually feel like you're part of a minion. You can feel like you're part of something. We're going to have chauffeur blowing. And I'm inviting you all, it's going to, I'm telling you, it's going to be limited space. Everyone's going to have a time slot when they can come, right? So let's say you're at one o'clock, be there at one o'clock sharp because you come there at 1.15, you'll be missing 15 minutes of your service, of the 45 minute service. And the same, we're going to have two o'clock, three o'clock on the, on the hour, I believe. And the, the idea is to give people a sense of normalcy. It's going to be social distancing. It's going to have all of the precautionary measures that are necessary for a safe service that's going to be outdoors, but so that people can be can 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 have an experience that's meaningful. Additionally, we're going to have something which is called that's the pop in service, pop in shul. We have a pop up shul where you can make your own shul in your house. You can make for your own friends, and we'll give you all the tools you need to be able to run a minion, to be able to run your own. Right. So we're going to be doing both of those. You'll get information about that later today. But to really stop for a second, to really stop for a second and realize that our closeness to Hashem is our goal. Rabbi? Sure. Yeah, I, I have a question about the whole idea of minion. Don't you have to be physically near one another? I mean, you say, you know, a minion, if you have, if you, if you set up, like you said, a pop-up shul or whatever, don't, don't, don't you have to be physically in the same area? Yeah, to, people are in order to be, hopefully come to my house. No, no, but you're yeah. saying if you do something at your oh, you house. Can, you can host, you can, if you, you can host in your driveway. Have people bring okay, out I, I see what you're, okay. and have I people see sit six feet away from each other right, with their got, masks. Gotcha, yeah. And you okay. can leave it. And we will give you whatever tools you need to run your, your uh, Rosh Hashanah service. Okay, I understand. I thought you meant you could sit in your living room and, and I'll have tell you, the nine problem other is people it, it, it in is their not living rooms. Be, it, it's going to be a very terrible thing for our 
society if Rosh Hashanah becomes a screen to person relationship it's going yeah. to be devastating for us to try and and, and 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 think that we will have an uplifting Rosh Hashanah that way mm -hmm. I think it'll yeah. be it's a recipe for disaster and I think that the congregations who are even considering it don't realize that they may lose their risk of losing their entire membership I I agree their entire membership because people will not want to come back to a regular shul. People will not want to come back to a regular shul, right? Um, Marsha, you have a comment about that, I see. Unmute, unmute. You have to unmute. Yeah, if you're a small community, you can do that. But if you belong to a larger synagogue, it's going to be impossible to have people come together. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, look, I, I think even a place as, as like Bethy Shuren, our partner in this program, in this class that we have every Sunday morning, I would recommend that they, you know, go have outdoor programs in different parks, have each of the rabbis run a different one. It'll be shorter, but it'll be more meaningful that everyone actually has a real live service as opposed to a virtual service. It might be easier for the rabbis to have a virtual service, but it's certainly going to be less fulfilling for the congregants. And I think it really is critically important that people feel a sense of connection. People feel a sense of 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 of, of unity and, and, and to, to actually hear a live chauffeur. It's soul stirring when you hear a live chauffeur. When you hear it through a computer screen, it's 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 okay, you know, but it's not it's not it's not the same thing. Well, I mean, I, I agree with that aspect that it's wonderful to be together and hear the prayers, but, you know, as you said, Beth Yashur and it's got thousands of members, so. Right, so if Rabbi Rosen does at Levy Park and Rabbi Strauss does at, uh, at Godwin Park and the other one does, and in each park you can set up, you know, 500 seats, 400 seats, six mm -hmm. feet away from each other. You can have one in the synagogue but that one also can be only certain seats can be, and everyone has to be registered in advance. It's not, I mean, it could be done. It's not going to be easy. Obviously, logistically, it could be a nightmare, right? But, but again, we, we have to figure out a way to make it meaningful for our, for our, for our, for our community, because okay. I'm afraid there are going to be people who are not going to want to come back as is. It's terrifying. The numbers of people who are disassociated and are Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur Jews only. Rabbi, for those that don't know, Meyerland Minion is going to be having services at the JCC and they're inviting anyone to attend. Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, to get the invitation. Pardon me? I look forward to getting the invitation from you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so it, look, it, 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 we have to figure out a way for every for it, for it to be special and for it to be meaningful and for it to be hopefully uh, uplifting. All right, let's continue here. So we mentioned that we are standing in front of the Almighty on Rosh Hashanah. And our sages in our prayers have inserted the words that we are kivnei marom. And that is just like the sheep when they're being counted by their master. What, what happens is, is that, the, you know, the sheep are in, 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 in their pen, right? And they go through a narrow doorway and the shepherd counts each one of their sheep. So although we're a community in Rosh Hashanah, we're also being judged as individuals. And our sages tell us that we stand in front of the Almighty one at a time, one at a time, right? So yes, we're judged as a community, but we're also judged as individuals. There's no one else to blame. We can't turn around and say, hey, we're, where's everyone? Everyone did it with me. Right? That doesn't work. You know, in school, that would, that would be one of the defenses. Like, oh, I wasn't the only one. We all did this. You know what? Well, that doesn't work on Rosh Hashanah. 
we stand as individuals. And it's a time for us to take that, that responsibility and to recognize that we are responsible. And in Judaism, it's a very interesting thing. We mentioned this previously, that we celebrate responsibility. Contrary to other, you know, there are people who, uh, before they, before they undertake any type of response, you know, the Amish, what do they do when they're, they have one year where they go out and they, they do any sin they want, right? Before they get into real life and adulthood. In Judaism, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. Why? We take responsibility and we love responsibility. We cherish it. In fact, we make a bar mitzvah. We don't have a bachelor party. Well, last day of freedom, no, right? No, we don't do that. Right? On the contrary, we have a bar mitzvah, right? It's a celebration. What is the celebration? That now this young man at the age of 13 and this young girl at the age of 12 undertake responsibility. And we make a party for that. It's, it's almost, it almost seems ridiculous that the parties that are made today for bar, bar and bat mitzvahs out in the world, right, Bobby, right? They're anything but taking responsibility, right? They're crazy parties with uh, no, no, with no reverence, with no seriousness whatsoever, and that's a terrible thing because we're, we're missing the point. What's the whole objective? The whole objective is to take responsibility, to realize this is a serious thing. I'm being held accountable now, as an adult. We celebrate that in Judaism. We celebrate responsibility. And Rosh Hashanah is one of those days, which is why on Rosh Hashanah, we eat the best foods, right? Everyone go out and get your briskets, right? We get the best foods and we invite our family. We dress in our finest clothes. Why? It's a day of judgment. Shouldn't we be, you know, with trepidation, with terror, you know, with terror, can't sleep at night? Well, although it's a judgment, it's a celebration of responsibility. It's a celebration of our closeness to the Almighty. So that is what we're looking for on Rosh Hashanah, is for it to be a day that is unique and special, a day that is holy, a day that is pure, and a day that is filled with joy. Because we recognize that we're accountable. And we love that accountability. So it's, it, it, you know, it's, if we look... We're going to talk about this, uh, hopefully, looking at the calendar. Next week, will, next week will be the last class before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur um, for this program. Because Sunday, uh, Sunday the 20th will be Rosh Hashanah. Sunday the 27th will be Erev Yom Kippur. will be right, the, the, the eve of Yom Kippur. And then the 4th of October will be Sukkot. The 11th of October will be Simchat Torah. So we're not going to have classes for about a month after next week. Next week we have class and then for a month we'll be out. So I want to just talk a little bit and start preparing ourselves for Yom Kippur as well. So we'll do that. And then next week we'll talk about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, the, the, the triple header that we have and how they come into perfect connection between, be, between one another. It's not, it's not random holidays. And it's not, it's like, we, we almost have it outweighed. On Tishrei, we have so many holidays, right? The beginning of Tishrei is Rosh Hashanah, and we have Yom Kippur, and we have Sukkot, and Simchat Torah, and it really is outweighing. And then, you know, two months later, we have Hanukkah, and then two months after that, we have Purim, and then a month after that, we have Pesach, and then a month and a half after that, we have Shavuot, and then three, three months after that, we have again, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot. Right? So it's a lot of holidays packed into one. So the truth is, is that it, it, if you look at it with the right perspective, we're going to talk about this next week, we'll see that it really is one big holiday. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. Rosh Hashanah is the day of perspective, like, wow. Yom Kippur is the day of accountability. And Sukkot is the day of putting it into action. The days of putting it into action. Is that that whole paradigm shift of recognizing our accountability and our responsibility comes into play on Sukkot when we leave our homes and we say we're not going to get caught up with, with, with our materialism. So why do we blow a chauffeur? Why do we blow a chauffeur? 
specifically from a ram's horn. Because we know that Abraham and Isaac, when there was the binding of Isaac, Abraham found a ram stuck in the thicket, right? The horn was stuck and he dislodged it, right? And because of that ram, right, we blow a chopper. What does one have to do the other, with the other, right? It, was it also a Monday? And then we'll, you know, we'll have that, you know, celebration on, on, on a Monday. I mean, like, what's what, just because he had a ram's horn, therefore what? Right? What's, what's the connection? So our sages tell us is that the ram's horn is symbolizing uh, that we're willing to sacrifice. Even when we're stuck. We're stuck. We have, in our lifetime, we have many things that we're stuck in. We're stuck in the mud. We're stuck in, in, our, in our habits. We're stuck. It's a symbolism. That ram symbolizes us. Those horns, right? We can, we can do great things for, 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 for this animal, but it can also get him stuck. We have unbelievable abilities, unbelievable power, but we can also get stuck. And what we show in Rosh Hashanah is that we're ready to break free of them. We're ready to sacrifice our own whims, our own wishes, our own desires for the will of Hashem. We're going to pull ourselves out of that stubbornness that we have. We're going to pull ourselves out of our habits. We're going to pull ourselves out of the things that will bog us down and, and limit us. And push forward to become great free people. Free of those limitations. And that's what Rosh Hashanah really is. It's an opportunity to break away where we say, you know what? The only reason I'm not the person I want to be is because I limit myself. Rosh Hashanah is a time you say, you know what? I'm not limiting myself anymore. It's like someone who decides to begin a new diet. Right? What's stopping us from that diet? Our own selves. We limit ourselves. We can get inspiration from the outside. We can... People can tell us anything in the world you Can go to a doctor and the doctor says, you know, you're going to die if you don't lose the weight. You know, you're going to die. You're going you're to have a heart attack. You're going to have whatever it is. And yet people don't change. Because the only time a person can change is if we change ourselves. If we don't change ourselves, there's no way in the world that anybody can change us. And we're our own worst enemy when it comes to change. Because we doubt ourselves. I don't know. Could I? Could I not? Is this something I'm able to do? No, I don't think so. But we, we, there's nothing that we're not capable of. A thing that we need to remember is that when we reach for Hashem, we pick our hand up. We say, Hashem, please help us. You know what Hashem does? He grabs our hand. And pulls us up and says, here, I have you. But all we have to do, you know, that's why one of the blessings we have about repentance is that we're saying, Hashem, please return us in our repentance. Let me return us. We got to do the job. What are we asking? We're dropping it on Hashem now? He has to do it for us? Say, so just tell us, we can never attain full repentance. We can't get to that level. But you know what we could do? We can say that we want to and desire it. And then what happens? Hashem says, here, I'll bring you closer. All you have to do is want it. And if you want it enough, Hashem says, I'm there to assist you. I'm there to pull you out of the mud. I'm, there, I'm here to pull you out of your... Uh, of, of, of everything that you are stuck. There's a promise, right? That the Yom Hazer Yechaper Alechem Al On this day, 
on Yom Kippur, on this day, all of your sins will be forgiven. All of them. But all we have to do is ask. And that's again one of my fears. One of my fears of this coming Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur with it being for many people virtual because they're not coming to the Papin Shul is that they may feel distant from their own selves, from their own. And it, I think it's going to be a big challenge for people who typically would get their inspiration for the year on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, where they're just sitting on the couch with their family. Like, what should we do now? Watch television, follow sports, follow politics, or watch, you know, on two dimension, a chauffeur blowing. And I'm, I'm afraid it's a very difficult choice for people. It's a very difficult choice for people. Um, my hope, my hope is that uh, we are all granted our wishes for the coming year and that we are able to connect with the real essence of these days, of these awesome days. It's not simple. It's, it's lofty. It's, it's, it requires, like this morning, the chauffeur uh, blast that we did this morning. I said that what we need is this. See this? A blank piece of paper. A blank piece of paper. And what we need to do is start writing down the things that we want. Start writing them down today. What do you want? You need good health? Write it down. So that when it comes Rosh Hashanah, you don't forget what it is that you want to ask for. And every day we should ask. In every one of our prayers, Rosh Hashanah, the doors are wide open. You know what? If there's someone you need to ask forgiveness for, from, write it down. Hashem, help me forgive someone. I'm having a difficulty forgiving them. Help me. Hashem, I'm trying to seek forgiveness from this person. Please open their hearts so that I can attain forgiveness. Write those things down. It doesn't have to be a small post-it note. You can have a sheet, a long sheet, and write it out. You, you need livelihood? Write it. You know someone who needs to find their, their soulmate? Write it down. You know someone who needs a healing? Write it down. You know someone who's trying to have children? Write it down. Ask. Think big. You want to accomplish something great? You need help? You have no idea where to start? Write it down. You need a job? Write it down. Don't limit yourself. It's private. It's yours. Don't share it with anyone. It's between you and the Almighty. And every day you get a chance leading up to Rosh Hashanah to stop. I say when we, when we, you know, uh, when we blow the shofar, one of the things I try to tell people is shofar is like clicking send. You draft the email, right? You draft the email, you spend time thinking through every word, but then comes that moment you just click send. That's the shofar blowing. We're writing an email to the Almighty. The whole month we're preparing ourselves. We're trying to get connected. We're trying to get elevated. But do you know when we click send for that message to the Almighty? With the blowing of the shofar. So we stand up. We concentrate. We focus. And when you hear the shofar blow, it's like it's blasting it into the heavens. So let's not wait for the day of Rosh Hashanah. Like, oh, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, I know what I need to ask for. And, like, and we can forget things. Think through your whole year that passed. And if this is the first time, you may want to think five years back, 10 years back. Sit and think. You know what? I met this person. Maybe I wasn't respectful to them. Call them up. I got an amazing phone call last year before Yom Kippur. To me, it's still a mystery. But someone I know, not very well, someone I know called me up sobbing. Sobbing. Saying, Rabbi Wolby, I did something terrible to you this year. And I'm so sorry. Please, 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 please forgive me. I, I really had no idea what they were talking about. I, I, I said, they're nice people. I don't really have much to do with them. But they were like, they're crying, crying, crying. I did something so terrible to you this year. Please, please forgive me. I said, listen, I don't know what it is. But someone who's so genuine, someone who's so real, so sincere, how can you not forgive? 
right? I still don't know what they did, right? I have no idea, but apparently they, in, in a very, very beautiful way, made an accounting of their soul. And they said, for whatever reason, they feel like they did something wrong. And they want to they wanna seek forgiveness. Rabbi? Yes. Okay, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to phrase this. But there are a lot of three-day-a-year Jews. Okay? And they feel that they can do anything that they want during the year. And come Yom Kippur, they ask for forgiveness and all is now clean slate. That bothers me. That, that's number one. And then I have another question. I have a question, actually. Why do you have to wait for Yom Kippur? Why can't you uh, this Tuesday offer your prayers and ask for forgiveness to God for what you've done. Why does it specifically have to be Yom Kippur? You understand my question? 100%. So Ronnie, let me, let me address your questions one at a time. Thank you very much for an excellent question. The first question is, what do you do with the three day a year Jews? Um, and I'm, I'm inviting you to join the mission of Torch. That's exactly our mission, is to make three, a day Jew, three, year, three day a year Jews to every day a year Jew and to get people inspired. And that's part of, part of our mission is not to, I'm not trying to convert people. I don't have a synagogue. I don't, I'm not a rabbi on a, on a, on a panel that converts people. I, I don't do it. All we do is teach Torah. And Torch is an organization that welcomes every Jew from every stripe, from every background or no background. Everyone is welcome because all we do is teach unadulterated, unfiltered Torah. That's it. And that Torah hopefully inspires people to connect more, to learn more, to invest more in their Judaism. So I invite you to join our mission and invite everyone listening here to join our mission and bring even one person with you to the next class that you come to. Call a friend and say, hey, I have this class. I think you might, lo you might like this. We're talking about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, preparing ourselves for Sukkot, getting ourselves into the frame of mind. Why don't you just join me? And if everyone did, guess what? We'd have double the attendance. And if each person, then the, the idea is it's all, it's all a, a, a numbers game. It's not a membership game. We don't charge for these classes. I mean, you're welcome. Donations are always welcome. But it's not, it's not a fee for service. We are on a, in a very, very frightening downward trend with American Jewry where we're losing Jews left and right to assimilation, to apathy, to ignorance, and it's devastating. Where you have Jews who prefer giving money to, um, they'll give money to the to the you know craziest uh, uh, you know displays of museums, right? Instead of giving to the vibrancy of Judaism, it really is crazy. What's a museum? It's about what happened in the past. What's about what's happening now? What's about the present? The present is falling apart. It really is a problem. Right? There's only one demographic today that is growing in, in the Jewish community. And that's the Torah observant community. They're having children. They're engaged in their Judaism. They're three times a day Jews. Right? Morning, afternoon, and evening, praying every day. And we see our synagogues are dwindling smaller and smaller, less involvement, less involvement, less involvement. We got to wake up ourselves. We got to wake up our communities. We got to wake up our friends and, 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 and be shaken up to our core that we're losing people. So that's question number one. Question number two was, um, I don't remember. What's your question number two? Remind me. Why do you have to wait for Yom Kippur to ask God for forgiveness? Great Wouldn't question. Great question. I remember that now. Okay, thank you. So the second question that you, pre you presented is, why do we have to wait for Yom Kippur? We don't have to wait for Yom Kippur, and we shouldn't wait for Yom Kippur. But Yom Kippur, we have to remember, is the day where, like we mentioned earlier, the doors are wide open, where Hashem says, whatever you want, they grant you. 
these are the days we say Hamelach Basadeh. The king is in the field. He's waiting for us. He's he's among the people. He says, let's let's work out a deal. Let's work out an agreement. Let's get this done. We can do this. And we can. But Yom Kippur is a special day because that is the day where God said for the sin of the Jewish people, the golden calf. You know what God said? Vayomer Hashem Salachti Kidvarecha. I forgive you for everything you've asked. I forgive you for everything. It's the season of forgiveness. And that's what we're, that's what we're aiming for. We are aiming for total uh, exoneration. Total forgiveness. And that is really the, the, uh, the, the highlight of Yom Kippur, which is why at the end of Yom Kippur, many people have celebrations, not only breaking the fast, that's, that's the body, but the soul. There are many places where you go and you, at the end of Yom Kippur and they dance. You know why? We were forgiven for our sins. It's a promise that if you come and ask for forgiveness, you'll, you'll attain forgiveness. But we can't just show up. We've got to prepare ourselves, make our case. You don't, you don't find a lawyer representing a, a, any, any uh, side, any party, where they just show up in court without preparing for their case. They prepare their presentation. They prepare you know, all of the arguments. You can't just show up. And that's what these days are for. These days are to prepare us for the things that we need to change, for the things that we say, you know what? I made a mistake. I went down the wrong path. I was stubborn. I was mean. I, was, I, 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 was, I wasn't nice to that person. I wasn't friendly as I should be to that person. I cut the line. I played a trick on someone. It was just a joke, but it hurt their feelings. Whatever it may be. Or God, I didn't properly respect you. I didn't realize that you were there, standing right there in front of me, in the back of the classroom. You were right there the whole time. It really is, it, it, it's a special time, but it's a time we need to stop and not just let it, you know, let fate take its role. Yeah, what happens, happens, Rosh Hashanah. Take your time, take a piece of paper, take a pen, sit down after this class, turn everything off and start writing now. I have a sheet I have every single year. I start writing down the things that I wanna pray for, the things that I need, the things that, are, the success, and if it's for specific people, if it's for specific friends, for humanity, for health, for the Jewish people, right? There's, there's unbelievable opportunity. Let's not waste that opportunity. All right, my dear friends, have an amazing week. Thank you so much to our friends listening on our podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Have a terrific week and a Shana Tova. To all of you on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. Have a magnificent week.